and welcome to mini episode 287 of Real Life Ghost Stories. And we have one spooky story for you today and the story comes from the 25th of March 2023. And our story today comes from Clifford and Clifford has split his story into different titled sections. So I will read the title before diving into the story. So let's get into it. What my niece saw. There is a paranormal thread in my family. I occasionally have precognitive dreams. Useless though, since I don't know they are precognitive until a few days after when the event occurs. Typically something I see happening on the street or someone I haven't seen in a while showing up looking exactly the way they did in the dream. The most striking one was several nights dreaming of crashing airliners and burning buildings before the 9-11 attacks on New York. My talent, if you want to use that word, is weak, however, and it runs stronger in the family of my oldest sister. She has strong precognition, not only in dreams, especially about things happening to people close to her. Many times something has happened to me or another family member, and shortly, minutes, not hours or days, thereafter we get a wellness check call from her on the phone. Her daughter, my niece, sees spirits occasionally, The most striking occasion for that was when we were visiting the family of my then fiancé for dinner. My sister and her family live on the other side of the country, and this was their first meeting with my fiancé and her family. My niece, at the time a teenager, coming back into the living room after using the bathroom, said, I didn't know you had a Dachshund. I love Dachshunds, but it ran into the bathroom when I called. Everyone froze, as their Dachshund, which they'd had since she was a puppy, had passed away the month before at a very old age. My maternal grandmother died when my mother was seven years old. On the day she died, her treadle sewing machine and her clocks stopped working. I don't know what happened to the clocks, but I still have the treadle sewing machine. My mother tried having it fixed several times. The repairmen always said there was nothing wrong with the mechanism and everything was in fine working order, but it just will not make a stitch that holds. My mother's death and another death. Both of my parents are dead, my father having passed in 2000 and my mother in 2003. My father's passing was no surprise. He had been suffering years of poor health and increasing hospitalisation and I would say his quality of life in the last 15 years was miserable, especially as he had always been active and athletic. He had been a pilot in World War II flying a P-51 out of England over Germany on reconnaissance and escort duty, as well as an F-86 during the Korean War. So watching his frustration as his life became more and more constrained was very sad and hard, and made even more difficult for him since he was raised in a generation where he was taught that men didn't complain or talk about their feelings. The only silver lining was that when he did pass, he was in a room full of family and friends keeping him company, and I was fortunate enough to be holding his hand when he stepped into the next life. My mother had always been the more outgoing one of their marriage. She was the one with an active social life and interests outside of her marriage, and though she spent more and more time helping and caring for my father as the end of his life approached, she still managed to keep her own life and connections going and her health was, on balance, excellent. Myself and both my sisters all expected that she would have many years of fulfilling life ahead of her, a view that was reinforced by the energy she spent in the year following my father's death, planning his memorial, organising his effects and arranging a one-year commemoration for his passing. We were wrong, however. After that year of activity ended, she suddenly deflated and became unmoored. It was as if, no longer needing to care for my father or plan commemorations, she had lost all energy and purpose. Her socialising and outside pursuits slowly ground to a halt, but whenever myself or my other sister who lived nearby tried to get her to open up, she wouldn't talk, instead insisting that everything was fine. Eventually, she sold her house to my wife and me as we were expecting our first child and needed a bigger place, and moved in with my middle sister whose children had both moved on to college and was feeling empty nest syndrome. About a year after that, my sister came home one day and found our mother dead. 
She had suffered a massive stroke walking down the hallway at my sister's house and, according to the autopsy, was probably dead before her body hit the floor. This was devastating, as we had all hoped for such a different life for her after my father passed, in addition to the guilt one feels when a loved one dies alone. The only things that assuaged this for me were the knowledge that she was reunited with my father now, and that I had visited her with my daughter, then just over a year old and a sweet, beautiful toddler who loved her grandmother the week before. My sister told me there were only two things our mother had talked about in the last week of her life. One was how much fun she had playing with her granddaughter during the visit. The other was the day before she died. She had dreamt that she was at a party and that my father and others who had passed away, sisters, parents, friends, relatives, were all there celebrating and welcoming her. Everyone was young and healthy and she spent the time at the party visiting but mostly dancing with my father to big band music, like they had danced in 1943 when they met. This would seem like just an interesting coincidence except for something that happened a couple of years later. My wife's maternal grandmother, from the same generation as my mother, my wife's grandmother was a Rosie the Riveter character who worked and looked after her two children while her husband was away with the Marines in the Pacific campaigns of World War II. She passed away, very suddenly. My mother-in-law was living with her at the time and came home to find her dead. She was laying on the edge of her bed having suffered a massive stroke while sitting there after getting dressed. A couple of days before this, she had woken up very excited and happy. She had had a dream that she was at a welcoming party. Her husband, who had passed away about eight years before, was there along with friends and relatives who had passed away. Everyone was healthy and young and they were throwing a party for her. Like my mother, she spent the party visiting with friends and family she hadn't seen since their deaths, but mostly dancing with her husband to the big band music they loved when they first met. Myself, the floating thing. I was reminded of this when listening to episode 43, Three White Dresses. When I began dating my now wife in 2000, one of our first trips together was to Point Reese, an area north of San Francisco. It's a beautiful coastal area and most of the settlements are on Tamales Bay, a stretch of water known for oyster farms. Development is very controlled here to preserve the agricultural heritage of the area and because the only way you can get a house here is to purchase one that is already built, there is no new construction. Thanks to this, the area is either redwood forest, coastal cypress or dairy farms that have been there since the 19th century and there are plenty of scenic hikes and drives from the lighthouse at the southern end of the peninsula to Tamales Point at the northern tip, a 9.4 mile hike from an old dairy farm along the spine of the peninsula with alternating views of the Pacific Ocean or Tamales Bay and sightings of the elk that herd there throughout and a view of Bodega Bay from Tamales Point. The landscape is mostly steep, rocky hillsides, descending to the water on either side of the trail, with occasional strands of trees in the crook of a ravine of a hilltop. Side notes of interest. Bodega Bay, just north of Point Reese, was the setting and filming location for Hitchcock's The Birds. And if you are a fan of The Electric State by Simon Stallenhag, it is also the basis of Point Linden where the story ends. If you've been to Bodega Bay and Point Reese, some of his illustrations are eerily familiar. On our first hike out there, we started early and got about halfway to Tamales Point before turning back, as it is a moderate to heavy hike thanks to the terrain and occasional freezing wind blowing in from the Pacific. It was very early afternoon on an overcast day, and we were perhaps two miles away from the trailhead on our way back when we spotted something moving in a strand of trees on a hilltop maybe 75 yards away. Thinking it might be an elk or other wildlife, we stopped to watch. It wasn't elk, however, and what emerged from the trees could best be described as a floating, undulating black shape that billowed clear of the trees. At first we thought it must be trash like a garbage bag, left on the trail by careless slobs, but looking at the trees for scale, it would have been 8 to 12 feet high. 
maybe a tarpaulin. The wind, though cold, was not strong that day, and it was nowhere near strong enough to make a large tarpaulin billow slowly through the air. The motion was a cross between a gently waving flag and a swimming jellyfish, if that makes any sense. Then this shape floated clear of the trees. There was no visible sign of support as it moved above the edge of the slope. It then paused and reversed course, slowly moving back towards the trees, before reversing again. It repeated this a couple of times before finally vanishing over the ridge of the hill. We both had cell phones, but this was the pre-smartphone era, so no videos. Neither of us felt any menace, just a sense of how odd the whole thing looked. I'm still inclined to try and explain it away, but the lack of wind needed to move something so large, coupled with what appeared to be movement independent of wind, stymies all my efforts. The First Home My family moved to California after my father retired from the Air Force in the early 1960s. I was six years old at the time, and my parents had bought a new four-bedroomed house in the town of Los Gatos. It was one of the first developments in the area that was still mostly orchard and farms. But it was exciting because it was the first home they had owned, having lived in military housing since they had married during the Second World War. My two older sisters had their own bedrooms at the front of the house, with windows onto the front yard and street, and mine was next down the hall with a window onto the side yard. I slept with my door open. I had not overcome my childhood fear of darkness, and from my bed could see diagonally across the hall to my older sister's bedroom door. Shortly after we had settled in, I awoke one night to see a light shining from the direction of her bedroom. It wasn't a light bulb, but rather the sort of luminescent pale colour one gets from a glow-in-the-dark object. Bluish, only bright enough to illuminate an area. I rolled over to look and saw, instead of her bedroom, three figures through the door. The glow was coming from a figure of a kneeling human, facing my direction unmoving. The figure was wearing robes, like you'd see in a Renaissance painting of Bible scenes, and was kneeling, holding its hands clasped before its chest as if in prayer or supplication. There was no colour. The figure was in monochrome, the same colour as the glow and unmoving like a photograph. Between me and this figure, two others were standing in silhouette. They were humanoid in the sense of limbs, head and torso, but the similarity ended there. The bodies were pentagons, stretched out to rough torso proportions, with upper points making the shoulders, and the tip flat for the neck. Their arms and legs were heavy chains with thick oblong links, and their heads looked like simple elongated ovals, and what I took to be, at the time, long pointed bird beaks. But now I would say they resembled the long-nosed masks that plague doctors used to wear. All were completely still, as if frozen, and completely silent. Terrified, I pulled the covers over my head, afraid to call out for my parents or my sisters, in case that would get the attention of the silhouetted figures. I told my parents about it the next morning and they insisted it was a dream, that I really hadn't been awake despite how vivid it seemed to me. I even drew pictures of the beings for them. For the next several nights though, I was allowed to close my bedroom door at night. Despite this, I would wake up every night to see the shadows of the figures cast against the wall next to my bed, even with the door closed. I was too scared to look towards my closed door, and my parents and sisters continued to insist that I was just dreaming. Finally, after about a week, it stopped, and the house stayed dark. What my children saw By the time I became a father, I had forgotten what I had seen in the house when I was six. I became a father late in life, and many years and experiences, plus a child's terror, had pushed the visions down deep. When my mother offered to sell my childhood home to my wife and I as we started our family, I did not recall this. Otherwise, I might have thought twice. Things went well after the birth of our daughter, and when she was just shy of two years old, our son was born. Both of them were sweet-tempered, easy babies, and even toddlerhood and the terrible twos were nothing like we had heard from friends with children, so we felt very blessed, 
and still do, having watched them grow into amazing young adults. The only thing that seemed difficult was getting them to sleep by themselves. Neither of them wanted to be alone in their rooms. My old bedroom had been the nursery for both of them, while my older sister's room, where I'd seen the vision, became a study and a home office. When my son was born, my daughter moved to what had been my middle sister's room, so my son could have the nursery, so no one was ever sleeping in the room where the vision had appeared. My son was a late talker, over three years old before he could really communicate, but once he could talk, he began to complain about the thing that he would see at the end of the hallway between what had been my sister's bedrooms. It was like a shadow, he said, and it would stand at the end of the hallway and stretch itself out along the ceiling, arms raised over his head and towards him. We asked our daughter, who was five at the time, if she had seen anything, and she said she had seen the same thing. Just assumed that it was one of those things that happened and never bothered to bring it up because of that. He drew a picture of it, and I should note that his visual and spatial skills are off the meter. He taught himself to draw and was drawing three view and isometric projections of rooms and objects before he was four. And he drew not a child's stick figure, but the silhouette of a slender human shape with elongated arms hanging down its sides and the outline of sharp spiky hair on its head. It was always at the end of the hall when he saw it and it could appear night or day, the time seemed to be random. This was when I remembered what I had seen when I was six, and I told my wife about it. The house was new, no one had lived in it before my family moved in, and before that it had been orchard land as far as we knew, so there wasn't a list of typical things to suspect. Cutting to the chase, we asked the priest of our church, who happened to be the trained exorcist for the diocese, something I had been completely unaware of, having been raised Protestant. He is the priest that the character of Michael Kovac in The Right with Anthony Hopkins is based on. We asked him to visit after explaining that our children had been seeing the same vision. He came with an assistant and walked through the house, identifying the place at the end of the hall without being told by us. He performed a dismissal, telling whatever was there to return to where it should be and be at peace, and leave us in peace and blessed the house. Things were quiet for about six months before the figure came back. This time, our priest not only performed a dismissal and blessed the house, he blessed the perimeter and the yards, and the figure never reappeared for the remainder of the time that we were in that house. I spent time at the library trying to research the area at his suggestion, but could find no record of prior apparitions or any incident one would associate with a haunting. To this day, I wonder what was there to bring both the vision I saw as a child and the apparitions my children saw. An abandoned college in the foothills. In the late 1970s, my friend Robert and I were both trying to break into video and amateur film production. We'd also read a lot of William S. Burroughs and were fascinated by both the idea of cut-up and whether it could be applied to film and his notion that language was not a human creation, but an alien life form that was in a symbiotic relationship with humans. Just take some comfort, Emma, that when you do a podcast, an alien may be present. We were eager to find ways to apply this to video, so we did whatever we could to get involved in video productions. For a while, we worked with a guy called Carl the Cameraman, who was a freelance videographer, helping tote equipment around and doing setup, learning how material was recorded and edited. In the end, our projects never went anywhere, but I did get to see Dr. Helen Caldicott speak and have one encounter with a haunted place on account of working with him. I don't remember what the exact nature of this job was, except that it involved taking Carl and his gear to an abandoned site in the foothills above Los Gatos one afternoon. Carl wasn't sure what the place had been exactly, but we all suspected it had been a religious institution, perhaps a college or a seminary. There were old dormitories, a refectory, a chapel and what looked like meeting rooms or classrooms. All derelict, but still in good condition. There were a number of people living there. I don't remember if they were caretakers or squatters or a mix. And it was with them that Carl's video project was concerned. After we got there and helped Carl unload his gear, Robert and I separated to check out the grounds. This was a single handheld camera job 
so there wasn't much for us to do. I wandered to the edge of the property. It looked over Lexington Reservoir above Los Gatos, and there was a statue that appeared to be of a saint and some benches at the overlook, very peaceful and calm. After a few minutes, I went to look at the chapel. The chapel had been taken over by a woman as her living space and was decorated with her paintings and artwork, which I would refer to as early New Age. So though the former sanctuary looked odd, there was no feeling of wrongness or negativity about it, more of a sun-washed, cheerful eccentricity, if anything. Along the side of the sanctuary was a row of what looked like cells, either for monks, nuns or meditation. Each was about eight by eight feet, a window in the wall opposite the door and otherwise empty, though a couple had rusting metal spring frames or a small bed or a cot. No doors were on any of them and I don't recall if it looked like the doors had been removed or they had always been open without doors. This is because as I stepped into the first one, my sense of peace and calm vanished instantly, replaced by dread and a sense of wrongness. It felt like some predator was watching me and about to pounce, and the feeling from the cell was not that it had been abandoned, but that whoever was there had been taken away and suddenly by something very bad. I only checked a couple of other cells looking for signs or clues before I became too nervous and fled, returning to the large open area where I had parked and the afternoon sun was still shining. Robert appeared shortly thereafter in a state of agitation. I asked him if he had been to the cells. He hadn't. But he had felt something bad near what he thought was a dormitory. I told him about the cells and he confirmed that he'd had the same feelings near the dormitory. Shortly after Carl was done and it was still daylight as we drove down the hill back to Los Gatos. Carl also seemed to be in an odd mood, though he wouldn't say anything about it. This faded back into memory until the late 1980s. At that point, a friend from high school had become born again and was embracing evangelical Christianity with all the fervour of a new convert driving away most of his former friends in the process. He and I had still much in common, we were both sci-fi and gadget geeks, and we stayed in touch for a while until he decided that science fiction was a gateway to Satanism. In one of our last conversations, he related to me that he had found a new church run by a charismatic woman preacher and was even thinking of moving onto the church property to live. I asked him where this was and he said, It's some old seminary in the hills above town. This got my attention, and I asked him to describe the place. It was the same place Robert Carroll and I had visited. Trust me, get out. Have nothing to do with that. Certainly do not move there to live, I told him. He dismissed this as me being anti-evangelical and nothing more. But then I told him what Robert and I had experienced when we went there, especially the cells. Suddenly, he was very quiet and thoughtful. That's very strange, he said. A lot of people have said they are uncomfortable and feel something bad near those cells. We've had prayer teams hold vigils over them a few times. He promised me that he would be careful and think about my advice very seriously, something I knew he would do. He ended up leaving that group a couple of months later. The preacher was becoming strange and controlling. People were beginning to drift away and he couldn't forget what I had told him. The group had dissolved within a year after that and I heard, I had moved out of the Los Gatos by then to a different part of the Bay Area, that the complex burned down some time later. Since listening to your podcast though, I have tried going online to see if I can discover more about the place I had visited. There were a couple of schools up there, one run by a religious order. Both sites are now within a forest preserve, however, and the one I suspect I visited is currently having the parking and trailhead facilities built and is not open to the public. It should be open by the summer, however, and I will go there to look at the remaining buildings on the site and see if it is the place that I remember. My dream number one. Back in the 1980s and 1990s, I would spend a lot of time going to nightclubs in San Francisco with friends. I lived in San Jose at the time, about an hour south of San Francisco, but I was young and could handle the late nights and the long drives, and if I couldn't, my friends in the city were always generous with their sofas and other places to crash for the night. 
One of the places I used to frequent was the Albion, a bar on the corner of Albion and 16th Street in San Francisco that had a back room for live music. There was always a good supply of local music talent to see and occasionally you could see an act like Chris Isaac while he was still playing in bars about the size of the average living room. And as this was typical of smaller nightclubs in San Francisco at the time, the musicians often mixed with the crowds between sets. In short, it was a lot of fun. Once I became a parent though, my spending weekends in clubs drinking local brew and listening to local music stopped. So when my daughter was about a year old and I had this dream, at first, I chalked it up to memory. In my dream, I was walking along the waterfront in San Francisco, somewhere between North Beach and the M. Bark Adero. It was like the foot of Telegraph Hill in Waking Life. It was daytime, and as I looked up the hillside, I saw that there was some sort of construction underway. The side of the hill was being dug into, as if a foundation was going to be put in place for a new building. In the face of the hill exposed by the excavation, I could see three arched tunnels that went into the hill. A man from the construction company happened to be on the sidewalk and I asked him about the tunnels and he told me that they were being explored as they had been uncovered by the construction work and might be of some historic interest. I happened to notice that I was at the corner of Albion and some other street, nowhere near correct geography for what it's worth, the Albion bar is a good distance from the dream location, and for whatever reason the dream was very vivid, clear and stuck with me after waking. I don't recall why I went online to look up Albion Avenue the next day. Perhaps I was curious to see if the Albion was still there and who was playing there. What I found was a listing for a real estate auction of the Albion Castle in San Francisco. Curious, I followed the link and found that it had originally been a brewery located in what was now a poor high crime part of San Francisco that I had never been to. The brewery had its own water supply and underground cisterns. When I checked the photos of the cisterns, they were exactly like the tunnels I had seen in my dream. Sadly, I was in no position to bid in a real estate auction at the time, especially for an historic property in San Francisco, otherwise I would have done so. My dream number two. This is my last story, and it's about a very vivid dream I had in the mid-1990s. I was in a building in a large passageway like those that would lead from the lobby of a large hotel to the smaller corridors where the guest rooms were. Being in the interior of the building there were no windows so I have no idea what time of day the dream was set in. It was a comfortable feeling though. The architecture is a style common in the early 20th century California that goes by the name Spanish Revival or Mission Revival here. Adobe or stucco walls with dark wood framing of doors are common. In this case, the walls were a warm ochre colour, rough plaster, with dark wood doors and framing to passages. Lighting was ceiling lamps and wall sconces, dark brown metal with mica shades that added to the warm and relaxed atmosphere. It's one of my favourite architectural styles, so my feeling was contentment and relaxation as I stood in the wide carpeted passage looking through a framed entry to a corridor that ran perpendicular to the direction I was facing so I could only see the wall opposite the opening, not down the corridor in either direction. As I watched, four figures emerged from the left to walk down the corridor. Humans, male and female, looking like they were in their 30s or early 40s, as best as I could tell from what I could see of their faces. They were wearing black robes. I have the impression that the fabric was heavy, like corduroy, that hung over their bodies, and each had a headdress made of black iron. These varied from simple, like a squat version of the crown of Lower Egypt, to ornate, four-piece helmet wrapped in an elaborate working of ivy vines and leaves in the same black iron. They moved slowly as if tired and preoccupied, and did not notice me as they proceeded abreast, out of view to the right. Curious, I walked into the corridor and followed them. It was then that I noticed the amount of dust on their robes and saw that their headgear had a tracing of spiderwebs over a layer of dust. I was surprised by this and stopped walking for a moment. Before I could decide whether to follow them or to turn around, however, I was pushed from behind and forced to move forward. I looked over my shoulder to see what had pushed me and saw the corridors full of people, all ages, dressed in all sorts of clothing from all over the world, shuffling after the four figures. 
The one thing they had in common was that they were muddy as if they had been dug out of an avalanche or a mudslide and some of them appeared to be bleeding from the mouth, nose or ears. The only noise, aside from the shuffling of their feet and movement of their clothes, was their steady low breathing. Like the four figures, they took no notice of me, simply pressing forward and carrying me along by weight of numbers. Not wanting to be pushed over and trampled, I looked forwards again. The four figures were still leading us all on, except the corridor was changing. It was no longer the stucco and wood my dream had started in, but instead seemed to be roughly carved from ice, with a beautiful blue glow beginning to shine through, and it was beginning to slope gently downwards. As we went further, the corridor became more finely carved, the icy walls smoothed and finished, and the blue glow stronger. The air was beginning to get cold as well. It was an unusual atmosphere to say the least, but I never felt threatened, just incredibly odd. Despite this, I was getting a feeling that I was in the wrong place, somewhere I should not be, and began to wonder how I might get back to where I was at the beginning. It was at this point that one of the figures, male, wearing a headgear like an onion top steeple with a narrow brim around the bottom edge, turned around and looked at me. His tired, detached expression instantly turned to rage as we made eye contact and he raised an arm to point at me. His mouth never moved, but inside my head there was a deafening scream, shouting, What are you doing here? At the same moment, my chest was invaded by a freezing cold, like a fist made of ice reaching inside and crushing my heart. That was when I awoke, frozen and shivering with the cold, pain shooting through my chest. I had to get up and make a couple of cups of tea to shed the chill, and my chest and torso were sore for the entire next day. I hope you found these interesting. Do I believe in ghosts? I've had enough direct experience to believe that there is at least psychic residue that adheres to places, and the next step to believing is that residual energy being conscious and capable of independent action is a small one that I'm willing to take. I certainly believe in reincarnation for what it is worth, and I've seen enough evidence of an invisible or spirit existence that occasionally communicates with us to believe there is some sort of afterlife. I also believe there is some sort of shared memory common to all humans and that it can be accessed if one is capable of mentally stepping backwards from physical experience, then from ego, then from self, until there is nothing but awareness and that the shared memory can be accessed at that time. And this brings me to the last story. I love music of all kinds and in the 80s had picked up Lost in the Stars, a compilation of Kurt Wheel songs covered by contemporary artists. One of the tracks was Ukulele Tango, an instrumental string quartet performance. This was a pleasant surprise since I like tangos and didn't know he had composed one and I also like string quartets. It was relaxing on the floor of my living room listening to the album when Ukulele came on and I heard it for the first time. I can't meditate, I simply don't have the mental discipline to be quiet in my mind, yet remain aware, but music can put me in a state close to that. The Ukulele did. As I lay there, eyes closed, drifting away on the melody. When I reached the refrain, an image came to my mind. It was like an old black and white movie. I identified it as silent for some reason. And was an iris open from a black screen to grainy film looking out from a beach. The view over the sand was gentle waves from the ocean. And offshore, a sailboat floated at anchor. I was suddenly seized by an overwhelming feeling of heartbreak and began weeping uncontrollably. I sat up, suddenly back in the present as the music kept playing, wiping my eyes and thinking, what the fuck? I cry at music a lot, it has quite a power over me. Shenandoah, Eternal Father, Strong to Save, or Ombra My Fu are some among many that will put a choke in my throat. But it's the emotion of the lyrics or melody that does that. And Yokolai, though beautiful, wasn't like that. Though I find Yokolai beautiful and still listen to it, that experience never repeated. I did, however, make occasional efforts to find piano sheet music so I could make a stab at playing it, and I finally did. It was then that I found it had been composed for Marie Galante, a French musical, and had lyrics added by Roger Fernet. The sheet music had parallel English-French text that tells of Yokolai, a place near the end of the world where the singer's wandering boat had carried them, a land where all the dreams and desires are fulfilled and there is no care or suffering. The refrain, however... But it's a dream, a fantasy, there is no such place, no yokolai, a sad turn indeed. Coincidence? 
Who knows? But I am inclined to think that listening to the music, my mind was lulled into the correct state to access a memory of the song. Going back to the very beginning of this story, I I love that you're like, I have precognitive dreams, but I don't know they're precognitive until afterwards. And that's such a good point. How do you know the difference between a regular dream and a dream that is precognitive? You know, and I, I would find that very frustrating as a talent, as a skill. But it does sound like there's some sort of knowing that's been passed down in your family, especially your sister just being completely in tune and performing wellness checks, as you so put it, just sort of intrinsically and instinctively knowing that something is wrong with a family member and then passing that down to her daughter. And apparently it's quite a common thing in in lots of folklore and legend that clocks will stop in houses when somebody dies at the time that somebody dies. In fact, I'm pretty sure that came up in a story that we were that we read out recently. And if it sounds like I'm just making bizarre, disjointed comments, I'm actually just going back chronologically through the stories and adding my thoughts chronologically. And I have to say that your story about your mother having that dream of seeing everybody having a party and seeing sisters, parents, friends, relatives all there celebrating, welcoming her and obviously your father and seeing him and dancing with him and then passing away not long afterwards. I, I, I have to say I found that very emotional and I found it so fascinating that it happened also to your wife's maternal grandmother. That same, that same thing again, having that dream of friends and family and people that have all passed away and them being welcoming and and lovely and then all of a sudden they die. Oh and just to say as well if I pronounced any things incorrectly in this story I apologise. I you know I do my best but I don't always get it right and I don't know what it is that you saw sort of billowing through the air and yeah, the three dresses story, I think that I believe that was Carmen's story from back way back in the beginning of the podcast. And I understand what you mean. Like if it was a black bag, you'd know it was a black bag, but it also probably wouldn't be blowing around like that seemingly independently. Kind of gives me nope vibes as in the Jordan Peele film. This black jellyfish like structure that is able to self propel through the air. Like what does that even mean? Is does that count as a UFO? You know, we've had stories of orbs, shadows, entities pulsating through the air. Is it that kind of thing? Like, is it literally just a ball of energy, like a mass of energy moving around? And I just have to say as well, that description of those creatures that you saw with pentagonal bodies sound absolutely hideous absolutely hideous and then to be in that house later and for your children to be like oh no I saw these elongated creatures or whatever I would definitely be like get a priest in here quick kids let's get some sort of exorcism going on even even if it's just for a placebo you know what I mean even if it's just for everyone to feel a bit better and I do think there are places around the world like everywhere that just have terrible negative energy and it sounds like you felt that in that abandoned college in the foothills that you felt that negative energy in those cells and I think that sometimes awful things happen in places like that and then you you know you can feel it all those years later like call it whatever you want like stone tape theory or whatever but I just I just find it very very interesting that this religious university this religious college or seminary whatever it was seems to have been a place where there is a lot of negative energy held. And I wonder if in terms of your dream about the Albion, I wonder if it was something to do with the fact that that place held such significance for you in your youth and it was a place of joy and fun and you were obviously going out drinking, having a great time with friends, listening to great music. And I wonder if that's why it resonated so much in your dreams that you ended up having that dream about the Albion Castle. People often say that they dream about places where they had really negative experiences. So you'd have to presume that it works both ways. You know, that you dream about somewhere that you had really positive experiences. Potentially, if that place is then going through some sort of weird crooks or change. And you know what? Your second dream, I don't... Those dreams freak me out because it sounds like exactly what you described. Like you've ended up somewhere where you're not meant to be. Like somehow in your dream state, you passed into some sort of weird realm and you haven't 
<laughs> and you, you're not meant to be there. And then whoever is leading that realizes you're not meant to be there. And they're like, hey, you're not dead and on your way to the afterlife. You're just sleeping. Get back to wherever it was that you came from. Thank you so much to Clifford for submitting your stories. And remember, this story came from March the 25th, 2023. And if you would like to send in your story, you can do so by emailing it to reallifeghoststoriespodcast.gmail.com. You can also check out the website reallifeghoststoriespodcast.com. And if you are desperate for some extra content, you can subscribe to the Patreon. That is patreon.com forward slash reallifeghoststories, where for $5 a month or $2 a month, you get access to heaps of extra content, as well as every single main and mini episode completely ad-free. And on that note, I shall see you next time. Bye.